Um, hello everyone, a warm welcome to the Science and Innovation webinar series. Uh, my name is Rajkumar Savai, working as a group leader at uh, Max Planck Institute for Heart and Lung Research. I will be a moderator for today's webinar. And before I start the webinar, um, a few notifications to your attention. There is an upcoming webinar um, on executive coaching where you can learn a lot uh, to become a great leader in academia. This is on September 24th. So if you missed any of previous Science and Innovation Center webinar series, next slide, and on or the forthcoming ones, please use the left side QR code to access them. And also you can use, uh, you can provide your feedback using the middle QR code. In addition, I would like to inform you that you can still join us uh, for ATS 2020 virtual meeting using uh, left side QR code. So during this webinar, um, please feel free to add your questions to the chat and we will facilitate them at the end. So now I would like to start today's webinar on role of cytokines in lung cancer progression. So as you all know, immunotherapy is rapidly becoming the go-to treatment for a growing number of cancers. Uh, despite this, the technology is not without its challenges. Researchers are still learning how best to improve the immunotherapeutic regimens. And one of the ways is regulation of cytokine milieu. So with that, I would like to introduce today's speaker, the expert in cytokine regulation, Dr. Syed Javad Magdum, who will provide us deep insights on cytokines in lung cancer progression. So Dr. Magdum is Associate Professor and Faculty Member at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Magdum received his uh, medical degree from Tehran and had a postgraduate training at the same university and moved to Baylor College of Medicine and University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center as a research fellow. Dr. Magdum received many awards for his excellent work and few of them I would like to mention here, Lung Cancer Discovery Award from American Lung Association and on a Early Career Achievement Award in Thoracic Oncology from American Thoracic Society. So a warm welcome Dr. Magdum and thank you very much for talking with us today. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yeah. All righty. Um, I hope uh, everyone safely managing this uh, challenging time and uh, trying to enjoy the virtual reality that we are living now these days. Um, so thanks, Raj, for the introduction. And let me also thank uh, uh, ATS and uh, Science Innovation Center for giving me this opportunity uh, to present uh, some of our data and an overview of the uh, science behind the uh, role of cytokine in the lung cancer uh, progression. This is an honor and I hope uh, I can, uh, uh, you know, fulfill the goals and expectation of uh, ATS and Science Innovation uh, uh, Center. Uh, all right, just a background on Okay, how uh, All right, um, so as you know, lung cancer is the leading cause of uh, second common type of cancer worldwide and, and, and the leading cause of cancer deaths. It actually kills more than combined prostate, breast, and colorectal cancer. So that shows how important it is to uh, find um, cure and also prevention um, strategy for this cancer to reduce the uh, mortality and morbidity of um, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, intractable disease. So overall, as you know, we have two types of uh, lung cancer, small cell lung cancer and non-small lung cancer, lung cancer, which non-small cell lung cancer uh, uh, comprise a lot, eight, uh, around 85% of the tumors. There's the, you know, several subtypes of non-small cell lung cancer, and among them adenocarcinoma, 
is the most common type, which is a, a, around 40%. In regard to the driver mutation that causes adenocarcinoma, it, it's a very heterogeneous um, uh, disease. As you see, there are too many types of mutation that could lead to lung adenocarcinoma. Most of them are closely associated with uh, smoking. The most common type of mutation that is seen in lung adenocarcinoma is KRAS mutation. And unfortunately, in, in contrast to EGFR mutant tumor or ALK, um, uh, tumor that have ALK rearrangement, there is not really a specific treatment to target KRAS. Um, and most of the treatment strategies so far have been unsuccessful, except the recent a finding on some small molecule that could target G12C uh, mutant uh, lung tumor. Therefore, we need to find an alternative way to target this type of tumor, perhaps by targeting um, downstream pathway to KRAS mutation or the pathway that are cooperating with KRAS uh, mutation to progress the tumor. As you know, tumor is a very complex, uh, 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 you know, text, has a very complex contexture. It is infiltrated with different types of cells, including fibroblast, epithelial, uh, endothelial cells, and immune and inflammatory cells, which makes up a microenvironment which is tumor promoting. And the tumor-promoting inflammation has been included as an enabling characteristic of cancer back in 2011 by Hanneman and Weinberg. Why enabling? Because it can affect every single hallmark of the cancer, like proliferation, apoptosis, angiogenesis, and every other, um, those six hallmarks that we are aware of. So perhaps targeting inflammation could be a way to go after tumors that are not responding to the targeted therapies. This tumor-promoting inflammation could start from two different pathways, intrinsic pathway or extrinsic. Intrinsic is usually happened due to activation of an oncogene, and extrinsic happened due to an infection or smoke exposure or any other inflammatory st uh, stimuli that could activate uh, the, the, the downstream uh, inflammatory signal. No matter where that is stored, two important pathways, STAT3 stat and NFWB, get involved and activated. That results in production of a group of anti-tumor and pro-tumor inflammatory mediator, mediator, including cytokine and chemokine. And the balance or counterbalance between these two groups dictate the fate of the tumors. Lung cancer um, is not excluded from this tumor promoting inflammation. As you see here, tumor, lung tumor, and the adjacent normal tissue are infiltrated with different type of immune cell. And it's known that in the patient with lung cancer com compared to the control subject have high lo level of inflammatory cytokines such as IL-6, IL-8, and IL-17A, and some other cytokines which are known in, uh, being found in other studies. Interestingly, these cytokines have prognostic value as well. As you see here in this study, the combination of IL-6 and IL-17A level being used as a prognostic classifier. Patient who has high level of both cytokines compared to the one that has only high level of one or doesn't have high level of either of those two shows uh, less survival. Same thing goes for IL-6, combination of IL-6 and IL-8. IL the one which has high level of both shows um, the worst survival uh, compared to the one that has only one of them high or none of them high. This suggests that cytokine could be used as a target uh, to tackle um, the lung cancer. There are several studies being done using different mouse models 
it and also in vitro model that try to tackle each one of those cytokines that are summarized in this uh, table that been published back in 2018 by um, uh, Dr. Al-Turkish group. As you see here, KRAS mutation lead to activation of different pathways. Mainly we know it activates the hydrate kinase, MAP kinase, and signaling that are involved in tumor cell proliferation and survival. However, it's also activated NF-kappa-B pathway, which is the master regulator of inflammation and lead to activation of, and production of uh, a group of cytokines. So those cytokines could affect different type of the immune cells and stroma cells that are infiltrated in the tumor stroma. Among those cytokines, a lot of them are known to have pro-tumor function including IL-6, IL-8, IL-17, and IL-22. In order to test the function of these cytokines in KRAS mutant lung tumor genesis, years ago, we developed a model, mouse model, using LSL KRAS mutant model that had been developed by Taylor Jacks group, and crossing it to a model that we developed that drive or um, direct the uh, expression of creative companies into the club cells in the airway. As you see here, this caused the, uh, the expression of mutant KRAS only in the airway epithelial cells, which lead to development of a tumor in the lung. The process is very similar to what happened in human. It starts from this plastic lesion, early hyperplastic lesion, progress to AAH, adenoma, and so finally to adenocarcinoma. You can see the tumor uh, by histology and also you can see them on the long surface and you can count them and you can measure the tumor burden as well. This model uh, has some advantage compared to the models uh, that use adenocrine delivery. One of the important uh, advantage is that it does not cause the confounding antiviral immune response, which is important to be considered when you study the tumor microenvironment. The other thing is that it spares the unwanted uh, or off-target recombination of um, recombination in immune cells, for example, in macrophages. There are studies shows that the adenine cream model uh, causes the proliferation of macrophages when it's used in a cancer model. So, Interestingly, our model not only recapitulate all aspects of the tumor progression, it also associated with inflammation. It shows activation of nf v as you see here, increased level of pro-inflammatory cytokine like IL-6, chemokine IL-8, IL-1-beta, and also two important cytokine IL-17 and IL-22. It's infiltrated with different types of immune cells, macrophages, neutrophils. And interestingly, even at early stages, it shows activation of a STAT3 pathway, which is downstream to IL-6 and IL-22, and indirectly by, is activated by also, uh, also by the IL-17. So it, it's a model that could be used to study the tumor microenvironment. So putting all this together, we came up with this working model, saying that due to any carcinogen exposure, epithelial cells acquire KRAS mutation, which lead to activation of NMKB that causes a primary inflammatory signal um, and production of chemokine and some cytokine that affect the um, immune uh, population, change their phenotype and recruit them to the site of the tumor. And those uh, leukocytes can produce more cytokine that feed back to the same epithelial cells and cause the tumor cell proliferation, survival, angiogenesis, and progression of lung cancer. So what if we target those cytokines? So we did so. We went after every single one of those cytokines that we thought might be involved. We used the genetic strategy, which I used as six knockout mouse, and, in, uh, and we found that by targeting IL-6, or we used IL-17, and we found the same thing, that most of these cytokines, when they're targeted, they could suppress the tumor agencies. We also targeted IL-22, and we found the same thing. 
However, we were wondering which one of these cytokines would be the, the best one to use um, as, a, as a target. As you see here, uh, TH17 cells are the ones that are in charge of producing IL-17 and IL-22. Those cells, uh, for their differentiation, re require IL-6 in a stand 3. On the other hand, we have myeloid population. These cells, in order to have their pro-tumor function, also need to be, uh, um, to be uh, activated by IL-6 through a stat 3 pathway. And when you look at the human data, a different cord can be used. And you see here, the patient with high level of IL-6 compared to the one with low level of IL-6 has a, a lower survival rate and lower recurrence-free survival. Here you see three different cohorts and they also, they all show the same uh, effect. And also we know that uh, antibody against um, IL-6 is already FDA approved for different diseases, including some cancer, such as uh, multiple myeloma and, and Castleman disease, which make it a better fit uh, to be used as, um, a, an, as a target. To do so, we use a translational approach. We use the same cancer model and we treated them with anti-IL-6 antibody or control antibody twice a week from age of six weeks to 14 weeks uh, and we injected IP. As you see here, that significantly affected the tumor burden. This is the one that treated with um, anti-IL-6 antibody and tumor burden is significantly reduced. It reduced the tumor cell proliferation. It reduced the angiogenesis, as you see, here, and it also was associated with uh, reduced expression of a stat three, indicating reduced stat three activation. As I mentioned before, tumor uh, steroma is infiltrated with different type of cell. We know these cells who are in the left side of the slide, TH1, CD8 T cell, and NK and NKT cell, has known anti-tumor function. On the right side, we have a group of cells that we know they have uh, pro-tumor function. They, immunos they are mostly immunosuppressive and they suppress the CD8 T cell function. Those are TH17, t regulated cells, and some of the B cells. And in between, we have myeloid population. These cells, depending to their phenotype, could be pro or anti-tumor, which is important in for uh, our study. And as I mentioned, most of their pro-tumor function and immunosuppressive function is mediated by IL-6 and STAT-3. Among those cells are tumor-associated macrophages, with, uh, uh, with it, which uh, could have different phenotypes. This is a simplistic version of uh, macrophage uh, classification that is divided between M1 and M2 macrophages. M1 are the one that uh, um, are there to um, fight the bacterial infection and they coordinate an anti-tumor immune response and they inhibit the, grow the uh, cancer growth. They can promote TH1 response and they express NOS2. The M2 macrophages are the ones that are, have pro-tumor function. They support angiogenesis, they have immunosuppressive function because they express a lot of uh, factors such as arginine as well. Of one IL-10 and other factors. So going back to our model, when we treated our mice with anti-IL-6 antibody and blocked IL-6 signaling, what we found was re reduction in the number of all of those uh, immune infiltrating cells, including uh, neutrophils, macro, uh, lymphocyte, and most significant the macrophages. But the decrease in the number wasn't the only thing happening. We also saw significant reduction in expression of M2 type markers, showing that some of those macrophages that are still in there now switching their phenotype to M1 and they're not being immuno any more immunosuppressive. How do we know that? Because when we look at the T cell response, as you see here, the one that are treated with anti IL 6 antibody now express a lot of interferon gamma, 
granzyme B and TBX21. These are uh, factors that are cytotoxic, and this is a transcription, TBX, TBX21 is a transcription factor specific for TH1 population that it produces a lot of mutual and gamma. On the other hand, we see reduction in TGF bed and FOXP3, which both of them are indicating a reduction in a T regulatory cell response that fun usually function against the CD8 T cells. We also see the reduction in um, IL-17, which is main product of the TH17 cell. So by targeting a single cytokine, we were able to switch the phenotype of a myelase cell and also lead to a anti-tumor T cell response instead of having a pro-tumor T cell response. This data was published later in the cancer research. We also have uh, showed that neutrophils have an important role in this process because when we targeted, uh, we depleted the tumor from neutrophils or we targeted receptor for the chemokine that attract the neutrophil, CXCR2, or when we targeted Neutrophil elastase, which is an important factor that is produced by neutrophil, we were able to suppress the tumor genesis. This was, was also uh, evident in our um, uh, IL-17 study. When we targeted IL-17, we were able to reduce the number of neutrophil in that setting. And when we switched, the, uh, we put the neutrophil back, we, we, we rescued the phenotype in that model, showing an important role for neutrophil in this uh, process. So to summarize this part, I showed you that KRAS mutant tumor or cell have, shows activation of NFKB, B, which initiate the primary immune response, lead to release of a group of cytokine led by, led by IL-6 and chemokine such as IL-8, which recruit the immune cells, uh, including myelin population, and affect their phenotype in um, uh, reprogram them toward an M2 type macrophages and uh, myeloid derived supercell cells that have a uh, suppressive function uh, directly on CD8 T cell and TH1 population, or could uh, activate the T regulator cell population that can, uh, then, then those cells could uh, inhibit the CD8 T cell response. It also uh, induces. Uh, proliferation, or I'm sorry, the, 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 the um, uh, induction of a TH17 response, which those cells produce IL-17 and IL-22. And those uh, cytokines, two, two, two cytokines, through a stat could affect the epithelial cell, induce more tumor cell proliferation, angiogenesis, and also a stemness property, which I didn't uh, uh, mentioned in uh, this, uh, the, the summary of that I presented so far. So as uh, Dr. Savai mentioned, these days immunotherapy has an important role in uh, uh, fighting tumor. So how uh, immunotherapy became to the existence uh, was that because we know that tumor can avoid immune destruction. This is an emerging hallmark of cancer. As you know, when a, two, a cell acquire a mutation due to exposure to a carcinogen or some other factor, the first thing happen is activation of pathway such as uh, PP3, which get rid of that um, uh, you know, uh, mutated uh, cell. However, some of those cells could express antigen. So what happened that, the first thing happened that immune cell comes in to eliminate the, those cells, those transport cells. This is what happened in most cases. And in some cases, immune cell cannot get rid of them, but keep them under control. So they, uh, the tumor stay dormant. But in some cases, uh, tumor cell play smart and they can escape from control of the immune cell. How do they do that? One of the ways to do that is by induction or um, activation of those immune checkpoint uh, molecules, such as PD-1 and CTLA-4 that express on the surface of uh, T cell. When that happened, they put a break on function of CD8 T cell. The CD8 T cell get exhausted and they cannot attack the tumor and get rid of them. 
So with immunotherapy, what uh, these day um, uh, scientists and physicians do, that they use antibody that could block those immune checkpoint molecules, such as PD-1 and CTLA-4, and uh, inhibit their function. So this way, CD-80 cells stay active and target the tumor. Uh, and uh, back in 2015, this is one of the studies that been published uh, showing the effectiveness of this approach in patients with lung adenocarcinoma. I have to mention that this approach has been very successful in melanoma, and there is some success in uh, lung cancer, as you see here. The blue line shows the patient that's been treated with anti-PD-1 antibody, nivolumab, and the green one shows the patient that's been treated with chemo, Dacetaxel, and the one with uh, Nevo has a better, shows a uh, better overall survival. However, not all the tumor respond to immunotherapy because not all of them are infiltrated with T cell. Not all of them are warm and have immune cell infiltrated in there. And as Dr. Savai mentioned, infiltration of other type of immune cell besides CD8 T cell, such as myeloid population, with immunosuppressive function can inhibit the effect, uh, su suppress or reduce the effect effectiveness of the immune checkpoint blockade. So these are the questions that we'll be trying to answer. First of all, we want to see whether uh, KRAS mutant lung tumor respond to PD-1 blockade. The second question with how does PD-1 blockade compare to IL-6 blockade? Do they fare the same or differently? And the, most importantly, whether we can reprogram the, the lung TME or tumor microenvironment by IL-6 blockade or any other of those cytokines that I mentioned uh, previously to induce a most robust, robust and sustainable cytotoxic response by anti-PD-1 therapy and whether we can use this combination as a new adjuvant or adjuvant therapy. These are the, the projects that are ongoing in my laboratory and I'm sure in other laboratory um, and um, waiting uh, the result to come up. Hopefully next time I can share some of those data with you. The other thing which is important, whether we can use this approach for prevention you know that patients with COPD have higher risk of lung cancer with the patient without COPD, independent of the smoking. COPD patients have three to 10 times higher risk of lung cancer. So those are the people who might benefit from prevention. Unfortunately, we know that inflammation still persists uh, in the airway even after a smoking cessation. And those patients still have higher risk of lung cancer even they don't smoke. And these days with increased diagnosis of early stage uh, lung tumor with low dose CT screening program, prevention and um, inhibition of the pre-malignant lesion, lesion progression to advanced lung vision is very important. And maybe targeting inflammation and cytokine could be used in this setting too. In support of this, in 2017, a study published that supports uh, this ID. So it was a randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled trial. They used around 10,000 patients that had history of myocardial infarction and they had atherosclerosis but they did not have any previously diagnosed cancer, but they considered the one that have high, um, the, the high sensitivity CRP level of um, equal or greater than two milligram per liter. And they uh, randomized them um, in four groups. A group of them received just placebo, and the other three groups received an antibody against IL-1 beta. In different doses, 50 milligram, 150 milligram, and 300 milligram sub Q every three months. This study wasn't designed for, to, to, uh, to, for the cancer, 
they were looking whether this could prevent uh, the, um, the incidence of cardiovascular events in this patient. However, they looked at the cancer incidence and cancer mortality in this group. As you know, IL-1 beta not only is a product of NF-kappa B activation, it also is one of the main activators of NF-kappa B pathway. It binds to its receptor and activates uh, several downstream pathways which lead to activation of NF-kappa B and production of most of those cytokines that I already um, covered during my talk. And it's known that high level of uh, IL-1 beta is ex it exists in serum of a lung cancer patient and it's correlated with cool prognosis. And in different mouse models, high level IL-1 beta, even in absence or presence of COPD has been uh, uh, documented. And interestingly, IL-1 beta is uh, important for the expansion and effect or function of TH17 cells. So those are the cells that produce IL-17 and the R group and others have shown that has important role in KRAS mutant lung cancer. So when they compare the survival and cancer incidence on those patients that were receiving the, the canonic uh, um, <laughs> they found that Patient who received that anti IL-1 blockade in a dose-dependent uh, fashion shows a significant reduction in cancer incidence. And they also shows um, lower uh, mortality from um, cancer. Interestingly, the one that uh, developed lung cancer, those were the one that high level of IL-6, again, uh, suggesting that IL-6 is an essential cytokine for uh, promotion uh, and progression of lung cancer, and specifically um, in this setting. According to this finding, three trial right now is underway. These are mostly, uh, these are not prevention trial, these are for treatment. In Canopy-1, they are using um, IL-1 beta blockade. Uh, as an adjuvant therapy in patient with surgically resected uh, non-small cell lung cancer. In Canopy-1, they are using the combination of femurilizumab, which is uh, immune checkpoint blockade, plus platinum-based uh, doublet chemo with IL-1 blockade in non-small cell lung cancer, again, but only in, uh, uh, actually in both non-squams and squams non-small cell lung cancer. And then Canopy 2, which is a phase three study, again, um, evaluating efficacy and safety of this drug in combination with chemo in patient with uh, um, nice small cell lung cancer as a second or third line of therapy. So in summary, I showed you that lung tumor microenvironment is very complex, is infiltrated with different type of cells and run by different type of cytokines. And I'll show you specifically that KRAS mutation lead to activation of nf and production of a group of cytokines with pro-tumor function and immunosuppressive function. It's mainly orchestrated by IL-6 and statue. And I showed you if you target either of these cytokines, you could not only affect uh, directly cause tumor cell intrinsic effect such as reduced proliferation and, and angiogenesis, you can also change the TME and reprogram it from an immunosuppressive um, pro-tumor microenvironment to an um, anti-tumor microenvironment and also affect the tumor um, stems. So considering all of these facts and findings, uh, we suggest a targeting cytokine network would be an alternative way to, uh, for treatment of lung cancer that could be combined with uh, conventional chemo, immune checkpoint blockade, or other target therapies such as MAC inhibitor, and also could be used as a prevention strategy in high-risk populations such as heavy smoker and patient with COPD. So at the end, I'd like to thank the people uh, who helped with all this study that I presented, past and present member of my lab, all the collaborators, as well as the funding agency that uh, 
without your support, we could have, could have not done this study. I'd be happy to, um, you know, hear your comments and answer any question. And thank you for your attention. So, um, Dr. Magdum, thank you for this excellent and deta detailed webinar on cytokines and how oncogen, the Keras oncogen, influences on the uh, cytokines and how immunotherapies can progressively then improve in future. So, I think we have uh, some questions um, at the chat. I think uh, the the first one is: uh, Does the timing of anti IL six IL six administration affect anti-tumor efficacy in the in vivo models. Uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, does the timing of anti-IL-6 administration affect anti-tumor efficacy in the in vivo models? The reason is uh, IL-17 has a pro-tumorigenic function in early cancer progression, but has an anti-tumor function at the later stages. So this was the reason to ask this question. Are you this was about IL-17 or IL-6? Uh, the question is about IL-6, but the reason was uh, about IL-17 as a taking example. Okay, um, so in uh, let me answer the, 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 the second group comments on uh, regard to IL-17. So in uh, the IL-17 uh, uh, function is very context dependent. In lung cancer, as far as we know, published by our group and Kwok Wong's group, IL-17 function as a pro-tumor cytokine. There is no data on lung cancer that's showing that this function as an anti-tumor cytokine. And same finding has been uh, documented in pancreatic cancer as well. In regard to timing of IL-6 uh, treatment, so we treated them early um, before the tumor advance, and we found those uh, tumor regression that I presented. There are studies that show uh, using the um, knockout model that shows early um, you know, intervention has a different effect from the late intervention. However, we did not find this in our studies. And uh, in our hand, uh, we think that, and we have some data that shows that IL-6 intervention or blocking IL-6 at any point suppress the tumor genesis. Yeah. Yeah. So the second question is, does IL-6 has the same roles in other lung cancer types with a different type of mutations? Uh, okay, very good question. So uh, there are groups um, that have tested IL-6 role in EGFR mutant lung cancer, and they found the same um, as uh, our group, and they showed the pro-tumor function of IL-6. Uh, they're not data in, um, I, I'm not aware of data with other type of mutation. I know also uh, same finding been uh, observed in KRAS P53 model, which is an uh, invasive and metastatic model. So yes, um, EGFR and does uh, KRAS respond uh, similarly to IL-6 blockade. The, the second question from the same um, colleague, and is the role of IL-6 dependent to the mutation type of ca lung cancer? If yes, does it mean that IL-6 has a secondary effect on lung cancer progression? If the question is whether type of mutation causes the release of IL-6, I would say, as I just uh, responded to the previous question, both SCARAS and EGFR mutant tumor are associated with uh, increased level of IL-6 and activation of STAT3 pathway. Um, so perhaps um, mutation could be important. The type of mutation could cause different type of immune response and immune cell infiltrate has been published in Cancer Discovery, I think a year or two years ago by uh, John Haymark's group that's showing that a different uh, co-mutation with KRAS causes a different type of immune responses. Uh, for, for example, KRAS LKB1 compared to the KRAS 53 or KRAS alone a different type of immune, immune responses. Yes, um, I would say mutation could
cause different type of uh, cytokine production. That's all I can say. Thank you. So I have a few questions. And uh, the first question is, uh, what is the contribution of, for example, TNF-alpha in, uh, in the promotion of the lung cancer? Because uh, Yeah, um, so that is, that is a very important question. TNF-alpha is also a product of NF-kappa B and also one of the main activators of NF-kappa B pathway. And we studied the TNF-alpha that I did not present here. And we showed that by Overexpressing TNA alpha in the same tumor cell that expressed the KRAS mutant, we could induce a neutrophilic response in the lung, and we bring the mildly derived supracellular cell and neutrophils that could uh, increase the tumor pro uh, tumor burden and uh, tumor progression. And then we also use the TNF knockout in another setting, in the setting of COPD. We have a model of COPD, and we show that uh, this COPD type inflammation can uh, promote the tumor. And in that setting, we inhibit the TNF alpha using uh, an uh, TNF alpha knockout mass model, and we were able to get rid of the uh, myeloid derived supercell cell and change the immunosuppressive microenvironment to uh, a, a microenvironment that does not work in the favor of tumor. And suppress the tumor. So yes, the NF is also involved, and uh, we think its involvement is more important in the COPD setting because, as I said, even the overexpression lead to a neutrophilic type inflammation, which is similar to COPD, and also it causes emphysematous changes in the lung, which is again recapitulates some of the aspect of COPD. Yeah. So you partly answered. I just uh, want to follow up this same question, whether the cytokine network that you nicely explained is very uh, elegantly in your, in your talk um, is important in a transition from COPD to lung cancer? Uh, yes, uh, definitely. As I mentioned, we tested this uh, targeting the cytokine in a COPD setting, and we found the importance for R6 um, TNF and also IL-17 in this process. And, um, uh, we, and we think uh, on those patients with the COPD background, perhaps um, uh, going after one of the side of would be better than, you know, going after something like IL-22 or IL-1 beta maybe, I don't know. So, yes. <laughs> Okay, great. And um, the cytokines you uh, nicely showed and you worked in your lab. So can uh, immunotargeting of uh, the cytokines can alter cancer metastasis? Are you working in this uh, context? of? Yeah, uh, in, in my laboratory, we don't work on metastasis, but, you know, as you know, that the, the seeding of the metastasis cell require an environment that can accept them. And then after they are seeded, they require growth factor for growth. So most of the cytokines are required for those growths. And I'm sure targeting those cytokines in a setting of uh, metastasis could also be helpful. And I think there are several studies that some of them are summarized in that uh, uh, table that I presented during the talk. And it's from a review article that they were actually metastatic model and they could, uh, they were able to target some of those cytokines and inhibit the metastasis as well. And I'm sure, you know, from your own work, there's some, some, some data also to support this, that this site targeting cytokine could be used for a metastatic type of tumor. And also uh, in those canopy trials, some of those patients are actually metastatic. Yeah, thank you. So are there any questions? Yeah, I, I can only see a few questions in uh, the chat. I think if you really want to talk and uh, take this opportunity to ask any question uh, to the Dr. Maktoum, and please feel free. You can also, uh, you know, unmute your microphone and you are welcome to ask the question. So one more question we have. Uh, what is your thought of TJ Beta? which is also implica implicated in KERA signaling, as you showed in, in, in a figure. Does TJ beta have a significant role in uh, KERA's dependent uh, tumor genesis in non-small cell lung cancer? 
and um, the the um, colleague thinks um, Sonia Jakulo NCI has some data suggesting TJ beta one deletion could improve survival of Keras betaant uh, transgenic mouse model. Yes, yes, that's correct. We don't have data on TJ beta, but our model actually shows high level of TJ beta as well. And we know TJ beta is important for uh, you know uh, T Rex cell uh, development, and uh, definitely that could be another target. And I think. Uh, there is another group beside the one that you mentioned. It's um, forget uh, his name. Uh, that they also targeted TG beta um, or overexpressed TG beta in a clear as mutant background, and they were able to uh, show a gain of function uh, of the tumor genesis. So the tumor well, were uh, actually more than the one with the overexpression of TG beta. Yes, TJ beta could be another target, but we have we don't have a data on that. So there are no other questions said the chat, but I have a last question. So uh, of course, you partly showed very nicely about the Keras oncogene on uh, tumor microenvironment, but do you think the tumor genetic background impact the tumor microenvironment? If so, then the tumor genetic background. You mean the type of mutation that tumor cell has? Right. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, as, as I mentioned, mentioned that you know, tumor with different type of mutation could cause different type of immune responses and activate different pathways and release different type of cytokines. So that's that's why I think, and I mean, I'm sure other people think the same way that the treatment for patient with uh, lung cancer has to be personalized based upon their driver mutation and co-mutation because the co-mutation also affect the type of immune response that is induced by a driver mutation. So, okay. yeah, yeah. So are there any other questions? So you're welcome to unmute your microphone if you really want to ask directly. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, hello, sir. Uh, Hi, thank you for your Hi. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you whether it, you um, you had a, um, during your presentation you said that uh, you're trying to find some answers to a list of questions in which uh, you asked yourself how does PD one blockade compare to IL six blockade? Um, uh, I wonder whether uh, you are considering that when uh, blocking or using anti anti PD one anti PD one, there might be some uh, mechanisms of resistance to PD one uh, because, for example, uh, we all know that uh, there is a higher migration of MDSCs uh, to the lung in the, in the context of lung cancer, and this might. Uh, 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 this might um, not uh, enable the, the the use of uh, the PD-1 blockage. Um, are you considering uh, any of those possibilities? Yes, definitely. That's why we want to reprogram the TME because we think uh, some of those mice that they do not respond to the PD-1 blockade mm -hmm. are infiltrated with its amyloid drive supersources or even tumor associated macrophages, tumor associated neutrophils that have even suppressive function. And they don't let the immune checkpoint blockade be successful. So by targeting, combining IL-6 blockade with anti-PD-1, perhaps we can overcome that resistance to the treatment. Yes, definitely. That's the, the study that we are doing as well. Yeah. Thank you. There, there uh, um, uh, one month ago, I read a paper about um, an axis between uh, IRF2, which is uh, a gene of um, uh, interferon regulatory factor 2. And, uh, there is an axis of, of resistance to P1 associated to, to this gene. Um, I think it might be interesting to, to see whether uh, 
the, this axis exists in, in lung cancer. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the targeting those pathway, interferon dependent pathway like interferon type one and type two, and mm -hmm. you know other related uh, downstream to those like sting pathway are being considered also to um, help to improve the response to the immune checkpoint blockade. For example, there are studies using uh, sting agonists to activate those pathway in combination with uh, immunotherapy. Um, yes, those are all avenues that could be, uh, you know, uh, considered for uh, treatment of lung cancer. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're muted. Raj? Do we have more questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so more questions? So if not, um, thank you everyone for attending this uh, web webinar. And uh, once again, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Magdum for this uh, excellent uh, presentation on cytokines and how this can lead for the next immunotherapies. Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Stay safe. Use your mask. Yeah. <laughs>